I'm Kaylin Smith. I'm here to talk to you today about TypeSpec, and I'm excited to see so many people here to, uh, to, to listen to this talk. TypeSpec is a relatively new schema description language that's come out of Azure. It was used internally in Azure for quite some time, but recently open sourced. Um, uh, but first, who am I? So I'm Kaylin Smith. I am a software engineer at Microsoft Development Center in Norway. So it was a relatively short commute for me to get here. Um, I work in an internal backend API that you've never heard of, but it's a large API with the intent on adding a lot more Surface later. So TypeSpec is of pr a professional interest to me. Um, importantly, though, I am not on the TypeSpec team. I've spoken with them. They're great people. Uh, but I do not speak on behalf of them, uh, so I have no inside information. And I'm going to try and stay away from forward-looking statements. But if I accidentally make one, please know that I am not <laughs> talking officially in any, in any capacity. Um, right, so today I'm going to be talking about the TypeSpec basics. What is it? Uh, the workflow, once you've got it, how do you use it? And then how does it help you scale? So uh, it, it, it's the same, in, in, this, in a sense, it's the same as like OpenAPI or whatever that you can describe your schema. Uh, but it has several strengths that, uh, that make it a better choice for, for scaling up large APIs. And I want to be clear, it's not meant to replace OpenAPI. So it's meant to supplement that and act on top of it. So you can keep all of your OpenAPI processes and stuff in place, and I'll show you how that works in a, in a bit. <coughs> so first up, uh, TypeSpec is a language. There's really only four primitive things you need to understand, and then you can kind of get the rest just by reading docs, and this should get you jump started. So models, operations, or collections of operations, which are interfaces, decorators, and imports. So this is a simple model, uh, it's model color. Uh, it's got two properties, color and size, both of which are strings. If you squint, you might see TypeScript, and that's on purpose. That's why it's called TypeSpec. So the idea is that this is a human readable, or programmer readable uh, format, and uh, so it looks like a programming language, and it's not JSON, it's not XML, it's not YML even. So it's something that we, you would be familiar with in your IDE. We can make a more complicated example here. So now we're extending the model with some super type animal. Uh, a collar here is optional. You can see the line comment here. Um, which is, uh, it's a line comment. It's actually lost during the compilation process. But the one below it, this is a, um, a block comment. This is not lost. This goes through the compilation process. And that's really important. And I'll demonstrate that later. Below that, we have two more properties, parents and toys, which are um, arrays of various types. The next main thing is operations. Uh, so this is a standalone operation, but usually you would use these as a collection, so uh, multiple operations in an interface. The op keyword is optional here since it's in an interface. This one defines a uh, operation called get toy price, uh, which takes a toy object and returns an int32. Int32 is one of the built-in types. Toy is one that is one of my types. Um, decorators are the third concept, so that's the et key here. So uh, a decorator is kind of just like a supplemental thing on the, the property, like annotations maybe in some, some languages they're called that. Um, so this one in particular is built in. It says this is a, a, a property that uniquely identifies this object. Um, <coughs> but they don't have to just go on properties. They can go on anything. So in this case, I'm importing the HTTP library, and I'm putting it on an operation to say this is the HTTP route where you can reach this operation here. So we can see we've got a uh, parameter, a string parameter that we're passing in, and I also have at path on the parameter, which means that this, is, this parameter comes from the path. The fourth concept are imports. So in this example, I'm importing files from different locations. These are concrete uh, files. You can also import libraries as well. Um, so this is, this is kind of one of the killer features, actually, because it allows you to split up things in a logical way, including into separate packages if you want. Um, so with OpenAPI, you just have this gigantic YAML file. It's kind of hard to split up, theoretically possible, but it's not really meant for that. Um, and with TypeSpec, that's a first-class fun function. It's just meant for this in the first place. Um, so now let's talk about it as a platform. So you have your TypeSpec written. What do you do with it? Well, there's libraries, linters, and emitters, and these are kind of the core concepts of the ecosystem. Um, so first off, 
type spec projects are just npm projects under under the hood so uh, every project has a project.json you can see here i'm adding some dependencies uh, to to my npm project and when i run npm install it pulls those down the other thing you need to do is to npm install dash g at type spec slash compiler to get the compiler on your machine and then after that, it's, uh, it's just an NPM project uh, that has a TSP compiler on top. So the next thing you want to do is to actually compile it. So here we're running TSP compile. Main.tsp is my entry point, basically, the main file. Um, and I'm telling it to run this emitter. This emitter in particular outputs OpenAPI YAML, uh, but there's different emitters that do different things. And I'll show you what the result of that would be in a bit. Uh, the other cool thing, there's linters. So there's uh, IDE extensions for Visual Studio Code and Visual Studio. Um, and you can get instant feedback, compile errors, whenever you have uh, something. So in this example, I've, I've put a route on a model, which doesn't make sense, and I immediately get the feedback that this is wrong. So very early in my development cycle, I get this critical feedback. You can also create your own linters, too. So that's super cool, because you can encode your own business rules into the compiler, which shows up in the uh, IDE for your developers. So you get really quick feedback there. And it's not that hard to create an, uh, a linter or, or an emitter, for that matter. Uh, so this is the uh, TypeSpec playground on TypeSpec.io. So if you're familiar with OpenAPI, you'll see that on the right. Um, on the left is the equivalent type spec, and as soon as you change it on the left-hand side, it compiles and puts it on the right. This is what that command that I just showed you would, would result in for this given type spec. <coughs> this is a contrived example, of course, but I'll come back to this. I want to point something else out on this slide. So I want to talk a bit about MethodScript. MethodScript is a program programming language that I created. Um, I would love to talk about my work stuff, but I'm not sure what I can or can't talk about there. But I can definitely talk about my open source work. Um, I'm actually not really going to talk so much about the, the programming language. But there's two features uh, uh, that are use an API that I have created. So there's a telemetry server and an update server. And uh, it's a very small API, but I think that's pretty cool because it's very self-contained. I can show you the, the example here. Um, and I'm going to show you, this is the real uh, type spec for, for this service. And it's an, I know it's a little small, so I'm going to zoom in on just one of the uh, operations. So this is the telemetry key operation. Um, you can see that I have the block comment up here with the uh, documentation. Summary is more documentation. Route is the HTTP route. Operation ID is the open API operation ID. It's a post request. It takes a string uh, key. Content type is always text plain. So this is basically, this is an interesting construct. It's, I'm defining the type as a string, but this only this one particular string. So it's a string const. Some more documentation here. You can see the triple quotes do a multi-line comment, uh, multi-line string rather. Then the last parameter is the body. So this should come in as the HTTP body. Uh, we're returning one of four different objects here, telemetry 200, 400, 403, 502. I'll show you an example of some of those in a minute. So when I run the compiler, what I get from this is the OpenAPI YAML. Then I can see this in Swagger Hub or wherever else your OpenAPI tools show you this. And you can see that the, the documentation followed. So I get the documentation through the entire process, which is super cool. That's really cool. Because if you're handwriting OpenAPI, are you actually putting comments in there? Maybe. Maybe not, though. Um, but in TypeSpec, it's very natural to do that. It's just a block comment. So here's what the here's what two of those events look like. So error just means that this is an error object. It represents an error, whatever that means. Uh, the first one's 502. The second one is 200. I have some other properties there. <coughs> Again, I have the docs. Those show up as well. So everything goes through just just kind of naturally. Um, so now you have this. What does my pipeline look like? So I used to have an open API based pipeline. I would hand write the open API. And then that would result in generating the clients and the server stubs. So the only thing I did when I converted this to type spec was add these top three lines here. So first I install npm install to grab the dependencies, then I compile it, and then I point the, the rest of the script to this new, what's now a generated open API file instead of, uh, and so the, the type spec is now my source of truth. Uh, so this generates uh, the client. I'm using a program called Swagger CodeGen CLI. 
you can pick whatever. This, it's an open API based tool chain. So if you've got something that already does generation there, you just build this on top of your existing pipeline. So I also generate the server stubs um, and the objects so that the data models go in both locations. And importantly, they keep the comments and everything in there as well. So your devs on your API get all of those comments, which can be really crucial sometimes. Instead of having to go and look at your internal docs and your, you know, whatever you did in your governance process. So, how can TypeSpec help help you scale? Um, so, for an ultra small project like mine with two endpoints, it probably didn't matter. It was actually probably more work to do the TypeSpec overall. But that's because I had to learn it all, right? And I don't really count that as time in the same way, because now I have that knowledge and I have a blueprint. And you have it too. This code was at MIT, so you can have it. Um, I have a blueprint now that I can take into future projects, and it would actually be, even for one endpoint, less work at this point. Um, for a small team, and even a medium-sized team, of course you're going to be spending time on some of your CI pipelines or whatever. So you have one dev sit down for a sprint to build your pipelines here. <coughs> your team has to learn type spec, but it's not hard. I just gave you the primer in 10 minutes. Um, and, and then you get this easy to, to follow schema first approach that your devs will probably like better than if they're writing XML or JSON or whatever. Um, <coughs> of course, the larger you get, it becomes more and more of a no-brainer to have a governance process. So when you get to a large uh, API, now this is the point where I define this as where you can no longer keep the entire API in your head. No one person can do that. Um, and so at this point, you probably have introduced some governance of some sort so that you get at least some sort of consistency in your APIs. But with TypeSpec, you can create paradigms. So your core team can create whatever package that has your core types, core uh, types of operations and things. And then your teams can just pull those down and get those for free. Uh, and so you know that when you're reviewing this new spec that the, the team has presented, you don't need to care when they say extends your object that you already know uh, well. You don't have to think about that. You know they did it right. So it really helps to keep the, uh, the, the less stuff in the front brain, which is really important. Um, governance is super critical because this is the only stage where your API is going to get a lot of scrutiny. Yes, your PR will get a review, a second reviewer or whatever, but are, they, are your devs actually looking to see did this property get added into the code? Probably not. So your governance process is super critical. And so when there's only one correct way to implement the spec, uh, then you should be generating that, really. That's, that's a fantastic use case for code generation. Um, and so it's, uh, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's also critical to keep the docs through this whole process as well, because that's where you're writing your docs as well. Um, so another thing, this is uh, the previous slide I want to go back to. So on the left-hand side, I have 30 lines here, a little less. On the right-hand side, this is 60 lines. So don't underestimate that. Less things you have to read is really fundamental to being able to have a good review process. Otherwise, you get information overload. And I can never remember this. I, every time I need to do open API anything, I have to go back and look. Like, OK, I know that there's an object here, but how, what, where does it go? Where does, what are the responses? I don't, I don't remember this. But the time spec is really easy to remember as a dev. <coughs> so when you get to enterprise scale, everything's hard. <laughs> there's no silver bullet here. Uh, but type spec can help you scale to this level. Um, at this level, you probably have an entire team dedicated to uh, a, you know, your governance process. and um, uh, so you can have teams that are creating tooling. So you can create an emitter, for instance, that outputs docs in your company-specific format or whatever other emitters that you want to create, lenters, to have your business rules enforced. Um, and there's something, this is an interesting graph. Um, th this, is, this shows different APIs at different sizes that, um, a, 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 you know, based on the, the left-hand scale is the number of operations, and the right-hand is the lines of code of open API. Um, you can see that it's roughly linear, um, but look at the order of magnitudes on here. So it's basically for every operation, on average, it's 100 lines of code 
of OpenAPI. So this isn't scalable in the sense that you can have any one person that is, or even a team that can really, really uh, focus on reviewing a million lines of code. That's just, that's intense. 10,000 operations, maybe you can have a team that has a good, a good understanding of that. But it's just really hard to, when you have so much stuff to kind of review, it's really hard. So I want to point out some things in the ecosystem. And I don't really have time to go in, in detail of these things. And I do want to make it clear that this is a budding ecosystem. So this was used internally for Azure. So if any of you are internal Azure teams, <laughs> this works great for you uh, out of the box. But uh, it's only more recent that it's been uh, open sourced. And so there's a lot of things that still need to be worked on. And it's, it's a budding ecosystem. But it's open source, so you can contribute. And it's being actively worked on. So the first thing is an open API to type spec uh, uh, initial migrator. So if you already have an open API spec, you can run this. You get the type spec, do some manual cleanup or whatever, and then you reverse your paradigms. So now the type spec becomes your source of truth. You generate the open API, and you keep the rest of your pipeline, whatever that was. And then you start building on top of it with new type spec tooling. Um, you can create custom type spec libraries. These are just JavaScript or TypeScript libraries that you build. Um, it's pretty straightforward uh, to do this, so it shouldn't take you too long if you're already familiar with the domain to add your own, encode your own business logic. Um, there exists .NET and Java client generators, official generators. These are super rough. Um, and they're not documented yet because of that. So, but they exist. They're being actively worked on, and you can follow the development on, on GitHub. Same thing with the servers. Uh, so this is the server stubs and the models. Uh, generating that is a part of this as well. Um, those are also kind of rough, but they are publicly available. Um, there exists JSON schema and protobuf. Uh, emitters, these are official, uh, officially documented and do work, so you can use those today. Uh, so if you're using gRPC or whatever, you can use this out of the box. Um, finally, I just want to point you out to some links here. Typespec.io is the official documentation site, so you can find everything you need there, including the API reference for uh, HTTP, you know, all of the decorators and, and the different packages that are available. I think you have everything you know, need to get jump started, but there's still a lot of stuff, individual decorators and, and other concepts that I didn't cover at all here. And finally, if you want to learn more about my programming language, methodscript.com. So thank you so much.